Thank you, David. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you here today. And I've been saying to everyone that's walking in, it's like being married again, because there's so many different groups and none of you know each other. But I hope by the end of the evening, you'll feel a little more at home um, and perhaps enlightened. So, just under a year ago, about breakfast time, I got an email from the Vice Chancellor saying she'd like a phone call. I was rather nervous by this and uh, initially sent entirely the wrong phone number, but we soon sorted it out and it transpired that she was ringing to tell me that I'd been successful in my promotion to professor. It took a while to sink in really and then my thoughts turned to the lecture I must give today, my inaugural lecture. What would I speak about? Given my tendency to challenge authority and throw rocks at the, con the, the, the accepted wisdom, it seemed to me to be a little bit counterintuitive that I'd been promoted at all. <laughs> but thinking about it, this seemed like a good theme to latch on to. So, being a chemist, I don't tend to think without doing things. I launched myself onto the internet to find some images that would capture this all-encompassing context. Fortunately, I've been rescued by Diogenes. Because you can find all sorts of things if you look on the internet for ageing, truth, cynical and wine. <laughs> Diogenes is pictured here in his wine barrel and he's reckoned to be one of the founders of cynicism. The nice thing about Diogenes is that many of his ideas still hold water today. And working on ageing, we're often asked about immortality and that's quite a hard question to answer. When are you going to make us immortal? Because it depends on the context of the person asking the question. For example, to be truly immortal, you've got to have a plan to outlive the solar system. And keep a coherent personality while you're at it. How many people here feel like the same person that they were 10 years ago even? Never mind 10 million years ago. So, my advice to you today is to seek immortality via the work of Diogenes by sharing your thoughts and ideas with others and to maximise your potential for doing that by seeking extended health because that's what we really work on. That hopefully will allow you to move forward in life and really contribute to the, the progression of the human race and for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to share a little of my approach to both of these. So, some people will recognise this. It's a long time ago now. The Cynic's overarching search was for eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, I'm having a Greek day. Um, which has been translated many, many ways. A good spirit, flourishing, perhaps even today you might call it well-being. For those of you familiar with our strategic plan, it actually translates in some circumstances as practical wisdom. This is me achieving eudaimonia as the best I could, age 17. I'm thoroughly enjoying myself and absolutely happy in where I am. And that's where we should be in life. What this picture, however, does not show is the blood pouring down the far side of my face from a split eyebrow achieved at a previous fence on the course, which rather disrupted the eudaimonia of my mother when I arrived thoroughly invigorated at the finish line, not aware of my rather shocking appearance. Still, back to Diogenes. Diogenes is pictured here not only in his wine barrel but holding a lantern. And Diogenes was famous for he would go about the marketplace holding his lantern up saying, I am seeking an honest man. He felt that the social norms at the time prevented people from speaking the truth, and he was determined to overturn this. He's also pictured surrounded by dogs, and it's said that he was very pleased with this association because it stems from the fact that he was often rude, he broke social norms, and he also broke taboos on a regular basis. And this leads us on to the last quote, which reminded me very much of my supervisor, Dr. Hart, who's in the, in the audience today, my PhD supervisor. And when we used to discuss academic life, 
late into the evening after writing, and he would say to me, all the world is mad except thee and me, and I'm not too sure about thee. <laughs> and that, for me, kind of captured academic life. So, for me, Diogenes' search for the simple truth is really what a higher education should be about. If we're going to do discovery and dissemination of knowledge, then we can't do it properly unless we subject it to Diogenes' famous lantern to test our ideas for the truth. Those of you who've travelled on the journey over the last 20 years or so with me um, will have seen the determination and sometimes dogged approach I had and I like to think perhaps you'll forgive the taboo breaking that happened on occasions. I know some of you were right along there with me along the way and I'd like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for your support in those places and also for your shared insights. They're really appreciated. Some of you in committees of particular times may recognise this particular facial expression. The Vice-Chancellor calls it leaking. So, my approach to life, how does this all come together? Perhaps it's probably best summed up, but let's throw rocks at it and see what comes out. Let's challenge what we're thinking, what we're doing, why we're doing it. And that applies as much to policy and process as it does to education and research. If you can't test it and find an ultimate truth in what you're doing, there's no point. And finally, you should also keep things simple. I'm afraid this is another quote from Dr Hart. This is an actual fact, a photograph of my third year mechanistic organic chemistry notes when he introduced us to Occam's razor. And I won't reread the Latin, but the general thing is keep it simple, stupid. So, how did I get here? As David said, I started out at Bristol. I did both my degrees there. And I spent some time synthesising these compounds on the right. If I can get my orange pointer. These ring systems here. They look innocuously simple, but you wouldn't believe how hard it is to attach a second ring to a first ring in, uh, in a flask. I also supplemented my income as a demonstrator in the organic teaching labs and there found a love of education and sharing what I was doing with my research. However, by the time I'd finished my PhD, I felt that making compounds and putting them in the fridge wasn't all there should be to it. There should be more. Now, at the time, the entire world appeared to be focused on making ever bigger, ever more complicated, ever more stereo centres, things based on natural products you can extract from a plant. I didn't really understand that. That didn't seem to me. I didn't be, want to be part of a 100-person army starting off with five kilograms of material and ending up 23 stages later with one milligram of something I could have got from a tea leaf. Why would I do that? I wanted to do something that would intervene in biology. And so I moved to Brighton, and this is, again, yet another 60s building in the middle of repairs. I seem to have spent a lot of time doing that. Um, I moved here to work with Dr Jerry Gallagher, who's also, I'm pleased to say, here today, who's a world-leading expert on catalytic antibodies. And catalytic antibodies are fabulous things because they're ways of taking synthetic compounds and making antibodies that can do reactions like enzymes. They don't just bind them, they actually do reactions. And so I was working with Jerry making compounds like these, things called transition state analogues, that allowed us to create novel enzymes that are proteins, that are antibodies, and they do reactions. That was fabulous. I really, really liked that work. Fortunately, at that point, I was given a lectureship, which made life a lot easier for mortgages and the like. And I then found myself collecting titles. I had a habit, and maybe this is why I got promoted, of saying yes and then asking why later. And as a consequence, all of these things and many more have happened to me. Many of them have been interesting learning experiences. Um, I do remember when I approached Professor Denyer, who's, who was head of school at the time, and said, I think I shall stand to be on the faculty academic board. What do you think? He said, you'll learn a lot. 
I think they learned a lot too. <laughs> so that was a great set of opportunities and that shaped my ability to contribute across the university. But at the same time, it gave me the freedom to develop my own research. And so I was a chemist who loved working on biological problems. At the time, the field hadn't been christened for chemical biology. It didn't exist. And I was seeking something to work on. Now, when I arrived at Brighton, there were five of us in an office probably smaller than this desk. So we stood up one at a time, typically. And one of them spent an awful lot of time on the phone to a man in Cardiff talking about senescence. And I was a bit puzzled by this, so you know, I asked him one day, What's, what on earth is this senescence thing you're on about? Um, and one thing led to another, and we got married, and <laughs> I found a nice biology problem to work on. And as you can see, that 20 years later, the effects of ageing are rather personalised, but we have gained a rather nice son. <laughs> so, the real content of my talk. Ageing. Ageing is a fabulous problem as a chemist because it's really challenging and even better than that, it's really important. And as we all know, it's always in the news, people are getting older, people are getting sicker, what will we do about it, the NHS costs. And this is just data for the UK, the latest data from the Office of National Statistics. The number of 65, uh, over 65s is going to double. But worse still, those of us who are in the 50 to 64 region, half of us have got long-term health problems that might be described as a disability. And if you've got a disability, you're half as likely to be employed. So not only are people sick, they're poor, and they're having a miserable time. As a consequence, the government has placed this right at the heart of the industrial strategy grand challenges. They've set themselves a task of improving healthy life, which actually isn't too challenging unless they fail to, to address the second half of that statement, which is the gap between richest and poorest. Because whilst the health benefits that we're experiencing to the Asian community are working well on the well-off, the poorest amongst us are dying younger and spending more time sick than ever before. We must address that gap if we wish to continue healthy and productive life. But is it even possible to do anything about that? There are three really key things you need to do in order to challenge a problem. First of all, you need to know what the problem is. So what exactly is ageing? And we'll talk about that a little bit. Secondly, what causes it? Because unless you know what causes it, you can't do anything about it. And finally, the important one for me is, can we make small molecules in a lab that will allow us to make drugs that will stop all of this bad stuff? So, what is ageing? What's it about? Well, this is Oliver, aged about 10, and this is his grandfather, aged about 75. The difference between those two, although the facial features are quite similar in places, is an increased risk of death of about 3,000 times. It's an enormously bad problem if you have a birthday. You should really be prescribed less birthdays. That will be much better for you, because that increases your risk of death more than anything else. Is it fixable? Nice thing is, there are organisms that don't age. So their risk doesn't go up. And here are two particular ones that have been followed, the Hydra and the Arctica Icelandica. Anyone who's eaten clam chowder? Maybe you've been to the States? Yep, you will have eaten one of these. They live up to 400 years. And every single measure applied to both of these organisms show that their risk of death does not change with age. That means they're as likely to die when they're very young as when they're very old. They're not getting sick and dying. So, because I'm sure there's some mathematicians in the audience, how, what does this really mean? So the true definition of ageing was originally coined by Gompertz quite some time ago now. And it's on the basis of this exponential relationship. And what we have is... If we log the data based on risk, so we're looking at the rates of death against time, you get a nice straight line. That means your risk is increasing exponentially with age. 
If you very much like maths, that's the equation for it. But the important thing is the slope is telling you how badly you're aging. If the slope's steep, you're much more likely to die much sooner. The nice thing about this is this also, this data, shows it's modifiable. This is from, from brown Norway rats, from, from Professor Brian Merry. And he took the same colony, and these guys went on a very serious diet. And they lived a lot longer, and their risk of death was much reduced. That's known as calorie restriction. It's one of the few interventions that's known to work. Unfortunately, as it's tended to be coined, um, it doesn't just make it you live longer, it makes it feel like it too. <laughs> so, if I'm going to design my anti-aging drugs, I need to know what I'm aiming for. I need to know what changes to the graph I'm aiming for. And so this is a model, um, set of model data based on what would happen in humans. The typical one we have here is the black line, that's normal aging. If we manage to slow it down, that would be success for me. So that's the blue line, we're going to increase the risk more slowly. If we could get to non-aging, we'd have a nice flat line here. And we could possibly go as the alternative for delayed aging. So we start increasing our risk a bit later in life. We get to 40 before our risk starts to go up instead of starting at 20. All of those look like positive outcomes. But it's also worth remembering, none of those are mort immortality. You still die if you're here, you've just got a much lower risk of it happening than someone who's on the black line. So nothing here is giving you immortality. And really, immortality is a little bit of a dodgy concept. So this is what we're aiming for. We want the blue line, or possibly the red line, or even ideally the green line. But that data is all very well. But it's telling you about chance of death in a population. It's not telling you quality of life. It's not telling you whether you're sick before you die. Maybe those flies or those people, maybe they were ill. Maybe they had a rubbish time before they died. So what we really want to capture is the aging process itself. But does that even exist? Or is it just that as you go on, you've got an increased chance of cardiovascular disease, and you get Alzheimer's, and you get um, aches and pains, you get arthritis? All of those things are just happening to you. They're diseases. Maybe we just have to treat them. Or possibly, those diseases are just side effects. And there's something fundamental sitting underneath that we could tackle. Or maybe, in actual fact, we're just arguing semantics and it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, some of you may recognise this guy. This guy's Richard Doll, And he is famous being the epidemiologist who demonstrated that cancer is caused by smoking. Very, very famous, very, very worthy. He did not believe that ageing existed. He was absolutely convinced, and you can see from his statement here, even aged 90, showing quite some signs of ageing to my mind, that ageing did not exist. And his thinking very much reflects the NHS medical model of ageing which is you get something that causes Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's treatment is given to you and it slows it down maybe, but eventually your Alzheimer's gets worse and might cause you to die. And there are all these other diseases, and each of these diseases has a specialism and a specialist consultant who will treat it. And if you're lucky, they may even turn up the same room with you at the same time, but that doesn't happen very often. These other things that we don't worry about so much, menopause, stiffness, grey hair, well, that's just something that happens on the side. So is that right? Does that make sense? <laughs> it seems extraordinary that Dole was still saying that, to be honest, in 97, because even in the late 80s, we had evidence from worms that single gene mutations could extend lifespan. And those worms lived longer, lived healthy, just one gene change. That seems a bit not, doesn't work quite so well if you've got multiple things, all of which happen. How can one gene change mean that all of those go away? <coughs> Equally, progeroid syndromes. Progeroid syndromes are typically from one gene mutation. Werner's syndrome is the most famous one, causes premature aging. <coughs> Here's a rather younger picture of the husband, about 30-ish there. And the gentleman standing next to him is a guy we met in New Zealand, a lovely guy, who was the same age. He has Werner's syndrome. That's the effect 
of having Werner's syndrome, and that is just one gene defect. So there's something there that says one small change can change the life course, can change your health course. And that's where the current model, and this is really something that's only been accepted in the last few years of ageing comes from, that we have a few underlying biological mechanisms that lead to all of these changes. And it doesn't matter whether they're degenerative or just simply irritating and you have to get the hair dye out. Some of them will lead to sickness and death, and some of them just lead to hair dye. The nice thing about this for a chemist is there's one point that you can challenge, and therefore, if there's one cause, we can have one treatment that fixes all of it. And that's what we've coined as anti-degeneratives. We should be able to target the few causal mechanisms to get something that stops arthritis, cardiovascular disease, all of those other things. So, what are the causal mechanisms? There's been a lot of them over the years. A number including things like protein error have been discarded. Oxidative stress, many of you will have heard of. Most recently been shown to be a byproduct of aging. It's not a causal mechanism at all. I'm going to tell you about just one. There's two or three popular ones at the moment. I'm going to tell you about the one we work on. And the story goes back over 100 years, actually. But it starts really with Alexis Carell, who's featured here in time with a marvellous piece of glassware he's built, alongside Lindbergh, who I believe was the designer. Lindbergh is the guy who was also keen on flying. Um, and Carell wanted to ask, can you grow cells forever? Important question. Really, really difficult to answer at the time, because tissue culture... We didn't have hoods, we didn't have sterile conditions, we didn't have antibiotics. It was incredibly difficult to do. He was very keen on having black rooms. He decided somehow this made them more sterile. Not sure why, but here we are. They're all carefully gloved up, and he spent hours and hours training everybody to make sure they worked exactly precisely so that things didn't get infected and die in the middle of the experiment. And he had some chicken cells, and the chicken cells were reported as having grown for over 26 years suggesting that they're pretty much immortal. There's an interesting problem here, however, that Corral didn't like negative results. Um, and so one wonders when the technician fed the cells every Monday morning, what happened if the cells died that week? We never know. However, we do know the answer to the question as to whether that was correct in that Lenny Hayflick came along much later and showed that Corral was in fact incorrect. Human fibroblasts, skin cells, grown in culture, have a finite limit to their lifespan. Hayflick had an enormous difficulty getting this published because it overturned the accepted wisdom of the time. It was accepted, all cells grow forever. You must be doing it wrong. It's just something that's wrong with the way you're culturing them, or you've got it in the dish, it's not real, it's nothing to do with anything. And the fascinating thing is, this picture cheers me up, because this is at a conference we run a few years back. Then Hayflick's here on the end, and so he's done all the work. The guy next to him is very famous, is Tom Kirkwood, who did a lot of work on the evolutionary biology, and had absolutely hated senescence. Would have nothing to do with it, and said, it's nothing to do with ageing, it's all just a tissue culture artefact. And then further along is Alan Richardson, who is the guy who pretty much disproved oxidative stress. So we've got the fathers of the field, and the half head on the end is Richard's supervisor, who also worked on senescence. So it's a nice, nice photo, because we've got the history all in one place. But 60 years ago, Len Hayflick showed that these senescent cells weren't able, were generated in dishes, and it also sorted a few things out, like <coughs> what makes cancer cells different from normal cells? Why are they special? And the difference is, cancer cells can grow forever. Ordinary cells don't. So, what's cell senescence? There's a lot of confusion about well, what senescence is and isn't, and therefore I'm going to sort of walk you through it a little bit. They are viable, they're still alive, they're stable, and they only come from cells that can originally grow. So in neurons and so on, we don't have senescent cells because they don't normally divide. Skin cells do divide in the normal person, and they can become senescent. They're very, very different to the growth competent precursors, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a moment. And when you grow them in culture, they're produced gradually. They're not dead, 
many of our students, and I see there's quite a number of them in the audience tonight as well, think that they become senescent and then they die. And that's actually quite a common misconception in textbooks still today. Senescent cells hang around, and that's the reason they cause problems, because they do bad stuff. And they are also not cells from an old person, old dog, wherever you... They're, they're not necessarily that. You still get growth-competent cells in really old people. So they're not necessarily senescent just because they came from an old person. So, if you grow them in culture, you get a graph that looks like this. And this is an enormous amount of work. As you can see, there's 100 days on here, which is not that long for one of these experiments. But you do have to be in every two days, including weekends and Christmas, to do the experiment. Thankfully, that was Richard's job, not mine. But the important key bit is that they divide over time. And every time they double, we add one to the population doublings. They keep going, keep going, until eventually they flatline and they don't grow anymore. And then at that point, the entire culture has become senescent. So that's what happens in culture and in organisms. We think that's obviously a barrier to cancer. If you do too much division, you'll get to a point and you say, actually, I'm doing too much division here. I'm going to stop now. And hopefully that prevents you getting cancer or secondary muta mutation. So, I said they're really different. This is the work of the guy he was being talking to in Cardiff. Um, so it's a joint work we did some years ago. And what's happening here, this is genomic data, and we've got Ys are all young, Ss are all senescent, so they've been growing in culture until they've stopped dividing. And then the guys in the middle of the important part of the experiment, they're quiescent, because that's what most of your body's doing. Most of your body's just hanging around, capable of dividing, but not dividing at any one time. And what we were interested in is what happens when these young or non-dividing young cells become old. And there's quite a number of changes. Some changes we just see are upregulated because they're doing growth. These ones down the bottom, and we can see the red colour. It doesn't show up too well in here. Um, the red colour are the genes that change <coughs> during senescence. And there's a big set of them that change. They change and they become, um, they express inflammatory markers, they express collagenases that break down your tissue. They're trying to signal to go away. They say, oh, hello, hello, I'm dead. It's not working so well. Take me away. But your immune system's also getting older and it's failing to clear it. Oops. Back one. So. The nice thing about senescent cells is that they look really nice as well. It's great. Richard drags me into TC every so often to have a look at things. And you can really, really see when a cell goes senescent. So I don't know how well it shows here, light microscopy. Normal culture, they're nice and sort of little and they divide and they look quite small and happy. And then once they're divided a lot, they get confluent and they have to stop because there's no more room in the dish. But when they get old, they get big and fat and lumpy and blobby and look horrible. And it's fascinating because you can see it happening. So you can see if you give a dose of radiation, you can see the senescent cells appearing and they look really unpleasant. And there's, here's some work from multiple places in the department. So Professor Yo Ron Yeoman's work with Richard on the, the glial end of things. Dr Sanderman did some work on migration. And this one I'm particularly keen on because we've got here three of the five who were stuck in the little office at the start and three, all of whom are here today and the lad from Cardiff, who was on the phone. Um, and this piece of work is particularly fascinating because vascular smooth muscles are the, are the ones that line your blood vessels. And what we managed to show was that when they go senescent, they don't just signal for clearance and do the same big fat thing everything else does. They turn in all these strange things here. They turn into something that looks like a bone cell. And we wonder where calcifactory plaques come from. These guys are actually capable of making calcium plaques because they've become senescent. That was fascinating work, and I'm hoping still that we'll be able to do some more on that. The other thing that's of note is one gene, and we're back to Werner's syndrome here again, one gene can cause them to be produced at a massively increased rate. This is work from Richard's PhD. Normal cells gradually lose the capacity to divide. So here we're looking at the numbers that can divide, the fraction that can divide in culture. And over time, 50, 60, eventually they get to the point where they can't divide. Werner's syndrome, it crashes. They only make about 20 PD before you can't grow them anymore. Strong link to senescence. 
that was quite some time ago. Um, this was also quite some time ago. Now, 15 years ago, we wrote in science, how does this all work? What do we think is going on? So, cell turnover. We've got our cells, you get wounds, growth, etc. You've got to do some cell turnover. You're going to grow. That makes senescent cells. And bad stuff happens when they build up. You've got that inflammatory response. Werner's syndrome. The senescent cells are made faster for some reason, and I'm not going to go into the details today, but they're made faster. So every time you do a division, you've got a much higher chance of becoming senescent. So bad stuff happens sooner. So there's a really strong link there between senescent cells and ageing. But it wasn't until seven years ago that these guys, Andrews and then, um, Kirkland and the PhD student Baker, finally managed to scrape together some money, because they couldn't get this work funded, because it was so much challenging the paradigm. They did it off some soft money they had from somewhere else. They finally managed to make a mouse that had a special genetic switch built in that when you gave it a drug, every single senescent cell in its body gets killed. And so it was a, they were able to take their mice and age them and age them and age them, and half of them got the drug, and half of them didn't get the drug. These two mice are litter mates. The guy at the top is happy, fit. He chooses to run on his wheel. He's, he's able to travel a long distance. He can travel much further than the sibling. This guy has kyphosis. He has grey fur. He's not running anymore. The only difference between these two is that the senescent cells have been cleared. That was the proof that getting rid of senescent cells is important for ageing. And it took us till seven years ago, despite the fact that senescent cells have been known about for 60 years. And that gives me hope, particularly for these two distances, because we have an 85-year-old lady who lives next door to us, and our local paper shop's about 400 metres away, so she can just about get there and get a pint of milk. But the train station is about 1,100 metres away. And the difference we could make if it was the same as the difference in the mice, would be to take someone who can barely get to the paper shop to someone who can get on a train and go where they want to go. And that could be absolutely massive. So, where do I come in? How am I going to fix this? Some of you may have seen this. <laughs> it's the only time I'll ever make page three. <laughs> and I liked the comment. So... Back to Basics Ron commented on the online article. And this is why I think education is important as well. Actually, he gets a lot of stuff right. So we'll ignore the first sentence. So <laughs> I'm happy being self-appointed. Um, nothing can slow down as a factor of two things. The first is your genetics and the second is personal lifestyle. Well, he's right. Genetics and lifestyle do affect your chances of getting old. He's known people who are 10 years younger and 10 years older. Well, that's also true. People age at different rates because of the genetics and their environment. The bit he's wrong with is no amount of potions is going to change any of that. And the last bit I'm a bit puzzled by, but um, I'll keep trying. Um, I'd like to say <laughs> there will be some potions to change any of that. So, science or snake oil, there's an awful lot of snake oil out there. Anyone who's been on the internet and looked at, you know, live forever, you'll find some amazing stuff. And here's, you know, a couple of people selling the, the, one of the compounds that's the basis of our research. The important thing is, however, is that, yes, these are small molecules, yes, these are currently unproven, but small molecules can achieve highly specific effects with very little side effects. They're called drugs. And we know that if we intervene in fundamental ageing processes, we can slow multiple pathologies. So all we need is the drug that does that. And that's my key goal. It also happens to be a nice way of torturing second years. Looking around at students, yeah, they'll get some nods from the back. Some of them have just finished it, some of them did it last year. I don't know if we've got any fourth or first years, not, not got there yet. So it's also a really nice one because actually it's a great way of starting to engage with the research literature when you're teaching. 
So I set the compounds I think are very interesting for that year and asked them to go and research whether they'd make a good anti-aging drug and produce a consultancy report. And often you find they start with sources like this, which is selling you all sorts of strange herbal remedies for scientifically backed anti-aging pills. Hopefully they move through Wikipedia, which I discourage use of, but it's a good starting point if you know nothing. And eventually, on the same compound, they move to the scientific literature. And they provide me with an evaluation, which is a really, really easy way of doing my scholarly activity by getting them to find the papers and read them for me. It also means I sometimes get completely new insights in what things mean. So, resveratrol. David mentioned we've been working on resverologs. Why did I pick resveratrol? Well, it's been in the literature for a while. It's potentially one of the compounds that's in red wine, it's in chocolate. It's probably the reason that French people don't have heart attacks, even though they drink loads of red wine. The, the French paradox, why do they not die of heart attacks? In actual fact, it's probably a problem in the way they record deaths in France, but <laughs> it's a good start. So, resveratrol was very hot in the literature and lots of people had worked on it and there have been early things in fruit flies and worms and been extended lifespan and all very marvellous stuff. But there were also ones where people said, I can't reproduce that, it doesn't work. And there were a lot of arguments in the literature about what was going on. And actually what's probably happening is there's lots of off-target effects. It does lots of different things. But it definitely increases lifespan in obese rodents. And that led to a very big trial with Glaxo. Didn't go anywhere in the end, but there's been a lot of attempts to say, well, what can we do with this? But they've largely been focused on diseases. They haven't really been focused on ageing. They've been trying to claim a cancer or, or for heart disease. Largely at the moment, because there is no licence for ageing. That's coming, and we're working with the people who are trying to get that through. But right now, you can only licence things for disease. And this has somewhat held up progress. The other reason is, for anyone who's done any chemistry, this was the alternative. This is rapamycin, which is the alternative popular thing in the literature. Every time you see a dotted line or a wedge, that's a stereocentre. Every time you have a stereocentre, you've got a chance for your molecule to turn into what you don't want it to turn into. So, resveratrol is a little bit easier to work on, and I don't think the project students would have enjoyed trying to do this one. So, our big question was, how does resveratrol work? There's a huge number of different papers saying it does this, it does that, it increases antioxidants, it increases antibiotic metabolism, it inhibits topoisomerase, well, that's not a very good thing, but lots and lots of stuff. What does it do? So, I said to Richard, wonder what we do with the resveratrol on cells. Can we chuck it on? And rather worryingly, and this is the early days, it actually causes senescence, which wasn't good, particularly when the guy who was working on it at the time was funded to you know, tune of a million a year and had a big lab in Harvard. He wasn't very pleased to hear that it caused senescence. But we said, oh, it's OK, it's a high doses, it'll be fine. And the important thing is, in actual fact, resveratrol is not the thing that mostly gets into your bloodstream. This dihydroresveratrol, where the double bond has been removed, is what's found in your bloodstream quite a lot. And that's why we tried dihydroresveratrol. It's one of the metabolites. Your body automatically goes in and says, what shall I do to make this a bit less toxic? And the nice thing is dihydroresveratrol doesn't cause senescence, even at high doses. So already we knew there's something going on here. So being a chemist, I got the bottling gear out and started to think, well, what's going on? And you can really see as as resveratrol is flat. A bit like, you know, the, the newspaper you get Amazon to send to you on a weekly basis and it gets posted through your letterbox successfully. On the other hand, dihydroresveratrol is not at all flat and probably more resembles the parcel that gets thrown over the fence instead. So they're very, very different, even only one, though only one bond has changed. And I rationalised, well, maybe that's exciting. Maybe there's something about resveratrol that it's sliding into DNA grooves, a bit like posting through a box. And dihydro doesn't. Maybe that's what's getting rid of the toxicity and the problem of senescence. So we got a PhD studentship, and we made a whole di set of different compounds. We were interested in the electronic structure and the position of the, the hydroxyl groups. We're putting bulky groups in, in twisting things, doing all the stuff that chemists like to do. And we got a synthesis paper out of it, which was nice. We'd made 40 analogues by the time we'd finished. All different kinds. And then we started doing the bioassays. 
true multidisciplinary PhD student. He made all the things and then he had to do all the cell work as well. Um, so we did these five assays. First of all, we're interested in how many things get killed. What's the dose? It's the first thing you do whenever you've got a new compound. Does it kill things? A lot of them do. Next thing is chi-67 positive fraction. This is just a measure of how many cells, percentage of cells that are still capable of dividing. The ones that aren't senescent. And just to sweep it up, we also measured the ones that were senescent to make sure that the two matched up. We also looked at CERT1 activation, and the reason we picked that is because that's what the big hot guy at Harvard was doing. He was interested in CERT1 activation, and so we thought we'd check all our compounds to see if they were activators. And finally, we looked at IL-6 suppression, which is a way of reducing all of those bad effects that senescent cells have on things. IL-6 is one of the inflammatory markers, and a re reduction of that would reduce um, that was postulated to be one of the effects of resveratrol that was improving health. So, first of all, killing things. Now, for each of these graphs, the size of the effect obviously is dependent on the y-axis. Each of these bars is a compound, so you can see how many assays the poor student had to do. And the blue one is just the solvent, whatever it was dissolved in. Everybody was dissolved in the same thing. And the, gr the red one is resveratrol as our positive control. And as you can see, there's a whole range of toxicity. Some things are more toxic at 100 micromolar, and some things are really not very toxic at all. In fact, some of them, one of them looks like it protects against the solvent, which is interesting. So we've got a whole range of what we call dose response curves. And typically we expect as the dose goes up, the response goes up. So we know what's going on. So we were able to pick all the ones that weren't going to kill everything at the starting point. Once we'd done that, we cut the pool down a little bit to the things that were, the, weren't too toxic. We then started to look at the mitotic fraction. What does it do to growing cells? Does it, do they all make senescent cells by reducing the mitotic fraction at high dose? And the answer is no. And the more important answer is, and I kept saying early on, what's this hump? Why is 10 better than zero? 10 shouldn't be increasing things. What, what, what's going on there? We expect it just to go down smoothly like V21 here. And there's a little hump on resveratrol. And some of the compounds had a really big hump and no downside. And what we've shown is there's something going on here that means that cells are somehow more able to divide when we dose at low doses. And quite a number of those are better than resveratrol are doing that. So just to round up all the odds, we said, well, were they making senescent cells when, they're, when we're doing the high doses? And we just measured that up. It should add up to 100. There are one or two cases where there's some interesting stuff going on. But for the large point, if it's not dividing, it's become senescent. That kind of makes sense. That's fine. And we were interested, again, as I said, in CERT1, because that's what everyone else is doing. And the great thing about this is, with the really, really small structural changes, we've got ranges from everything from negative which means it's inactivating the enzyme to better than resveratrol. Huge, huge range of doses. And the fun thing is the growth fractions aren't related here. We've got some in here, we've got some there, we've got some there. They're not all matching up with the same activities. You don't always get all the good activity in one compound and all the bad activity in the other. We also showed that most of them suppress the inflammatory response caused by senescence, which is also a really good point for our drugs. So, what do we know from all this, putting it all together? The first thing, which is really important, is really little modifications make a massive difference. You can just change an OH to an OME, and everything changes in terms of toxicity, activity, enzyme activity, everything else. Many of the compounds we made, even though we had no idea what structural features did what, many of them had better activity than resveratrol. And the really important one was getting that increased proliferation at low dose. Suddenly we're seeing we're able to make cells grow again. What's going on there? We also showed a whole range of other things which are better than resveratrol, but they're largely separable. And that's even better as a chemist, because that means I can say, well, that group's doing that, and that group's doing something else. So if I want this activity, I'm going to do more of that one. If I want the other activity, I do more of that one. So 
The proliferation was the exciting thing for me, so we, we chased that, started to chase that down and argue about what was the cause. And there were really only two options here. The first one is that senescent cells in the culture, because every culture is a mixture of growing and senescent cells in these experiments, some of them are dying off. And as a consequence, the number of growing cells appears to have gone up because we've lost some of the, the, the senescent ones. That would be really good because we've already shown in our mice that that actually makes them live, lo live longer and happier. The alternative is that senescent cells are being rejuvenated. Somehow, they've gone from not being able to divide and being in the right old state to being able to grow again. So we did some more experiments, and this time we started working with um, Professor Harries at Exeter, um, and we were doing more assessments. And at this point, we started working on senescent-only cultures, because it was a lot easier to see the effects on that, see what's going on. So we took our six best compounds, two of these are resveratrol and dihydroresveratrol, and we treated them right down to five micromoles, and we see this huge increase in cell number. Something's definitely growing in there. We're not seeing increased death of anything, so it's definitely something growing again for the first time. The Chi-67, I'd say 20% is quite low, really, for a culture. It's near the end of its lifespan. It's gone up. It's jumped by over 20% with each of these compounds. So suddenly you've got twice the capacity to divide again. And Lorna's interest is the RNA splicing factors. These things effectively control the types of proteins you make when you're ever you're expressing a sequence. They're special regulators. And they change with age, and they become more and more locked down with age. And what Lorna saw on her assay is these green, wherever it's green here, is showing that suddenly they're not locked down anymore. The factors that do all of that regulation are suddenly functioning again. And even more exciting, because it knocks the guy in Harvard in a cocked hat, is they're not all CERT active. So it's not CERT1 dependent, this activity. It doesn't have to have CERT activity. There's something else going on. So, the cell number changes. The lack of death shows this rejuvenation. Our senescent cells are suddenly able to grow again. The change in splicing patterns, and we also did telomere length, which is a measure of um, youngness in a, in a cell, are the opposite of those seen in old people. So the lockdown on splicing is removed, the telomere length is lengthened back up to normal. And most importantly, it's done by a transient mechanism that does not give you the immortal cells you'd see in cancer. It gives you a young, normal cell. Is CERT1 independent, so near Harvard. And the nice thing is, when we eventually got it published, and we didn't half have a job getting cell biology, chemistry, and RNA splicing into a publication that changed the paradigm. When it was published, it went global. We got a very, very high impact factor. We've been approached by all sorts of people about all sorts of things since then. Um, because it follows on that, we can rejuvenate cells. We can give normal proliferation. We can give useful RNA splicing patterns. That might allow us to reverse the changes you see in older people that cause all of the degenerative pathology and potentially even things like grey hair. And that gives us a signpost to the first real anti-degeneratives. I'd like to thank, in particular, Vishal Barar, who's the PhD student who did a lot of that last piece of work, Obviously, Professor Farragher for 20 years of fun and entertainment. The other people who helped us out, Dr. Sharon is a particular note working with us all these years. Many, many project students have helped out along the way as of her collaborators. And finally, Dr. Lionel Hart and Dr. Jerry Gallagher deserve a special mention for keeping me on the right track in both research and education. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>